الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله رحمة الله للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبته أجمعين uh, We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send peace and blessings upon <coughs> Excuse me, our beloved messenger Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Upon all of the prophets until the end of time uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah uh, This is a Wednesday session that we started last week on contemporary issues um, Where what we call in law, qadai fiqhiyya ma'asira, issues pertaining to uh, current situation. Qadaya means an issue that demands a legal, religious legal position. Fiqhiyya implies that it is something which is rooted, we talked about this a little bit, in the opinion of scholars or scholar. And so that designation is very important. We say qadaya fiqhiyya. Fiqhiyah implies that there's going to be differences of opinion. So very rarely should someone, um, at least in the academic setting, be like overly definitive on their position. And that's because we believe that, and this is very important, that issues of Islamic law, what we call bab al-dhunun. Al-dhunun means speculative. Because fiqh's job is to come in to where the sharia is silent or there's differences over what the Sharia is saying. In other words, it's not explicit. And we talked about that in the introduction last week. If you're interested in continuing, I would encourage you to watch that introduction where I go through some of that terminology. And this is something that escapes a lot of people um, because TikTok only gives you a minute, right? To really address issues and Instagram is limiting now people and 144 characters but it, it's a very important subject. So qadaya is the, is the plural of qadiya. Qadiya means an issue that we need religious guidance on. Fiqhiya, again, a speculative issue. And what that means in the process of research, and this is mentioned by Imam Isnawi, who says, that when a scholar, he or she, is trying to come to a conclusion on an issue of fiqh, there's the initial sort of assumption. Fiqh is Islamic law. Can I do this? Can I not do that? Right? So there's an assumption. What that person may think, based on the evidences that they know, that this probably is the answer. So what he means is there's a probability factor there, which is very important. That's different than praying five times a day. Right? Quran commands us to do that. The Prophet clearly commands us to do that. So those aren't called fiqh issues. Those are called sharia what Allah revealed, what the Prophet taught us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that designation is very important that we don't treat fiqh, we treat it as something divine in the sense of generally, but specifically we understand that there's leeway and that there's going to be scholarly debate, positions uh, held. Ma'asira <laughs> means what's happening now, that these things have not perhaps implicitly or explicitly, explicitly been addressed in the past, or if they were, they were addressed so in a different way, different formulation. So I actually have a podcast, and it's called SwissCast, and actually that's what I did, like throughout that podcast, like I talked about what is it, you know, what are, what are Islam's position on gun control? Like I, have a, I have a podcast on that. I mean, now we see uh, just yesterday, 18 young, young children, my degree actually is in elementary education, so that hits home, um, killed by an 18-year-old. SubhanAllah, uh, we see here in New York City, uh, just a few days ago, I used to take the queue, I think the queue in the end, um, the you know, brother was, was killed. Uh, we are in the situation of today in Houston, I know Muslim family going through a lot of grief right now over the issue of gun violence in their home. So there's a lot happening. We talked about also last week how nostalgia can only last so long. And one of the challenges of America is that, and I believe this is, is you know, I'm a little come from hippie parents, man. So uh, I think this is one of the tricks of America is to get people so nostalgic that they're unable to deal with what's happening right now. And they argue and fight over nostalgia. So they get played. Uh, and oftentimes when you talk with Muslims, you see that nostalgia. Like you ask a Muslim about Spain, they will give you the most unsupported historical account of Spain you've ever heard in your life. All right, it's nostalgia. And the other problem with nostalgia, it doesn't allow us to address problems in our community that need to be put at the forefront. Uh, so, ma'asira 
the reason that I like this course and I liked it when I did it in law school is that it forces us to be aggressive now with our religion. Like, how, do, how are we going to play ball? The Heat and the Celtics, who's going to play ball tonight? It can't be like, well, back in the days in Oklahoma, my grandfather was a farmer and mashallah. That ain't going to last. We have 18 children dead. We have economic inequality. We have the major, you know, sin of America is the sin of race, still un, unaddressed in this country. And we're the followers of Malcolm. If you live beyond 120th Street, you see the spirit of Malcolm still in that, in that area of New York City, where I live. So we, we as Muslims begin to need to ask ourselves, what value are we bringing to people today? And that's why I don't like it when we, when we talk with people about Islam, what Islam was. That's great. What is Islam now? And that forces us to confront not only our own inadequacies, but then what people are, have done to us. So being able to speak to the issues in front of us allows us to hold ourselves accountable, but then also to hold others accountable. So the danger of nostalgia, the second is the danger of romanticizing history, romanticizing past, to the point that I can live in the past, but I can't produce now. So this is going to address those contemporary issues today. We said last week that this happens uh, in a number of situations. Number one is that there is no explicit text. So for example, like last week, we talked about saying Rahimahullah or Rahimahullah for someone who has died as not a Muslim. And we actually began to deal with some of the claims that there was a consensus on this. And we showed there wasn't a consensus on this. We went through different centuries, quoted different incredible legal, legal scholars and scholars of theology who differed on this issue. And we talked about how sometimes consensus is a way to shut people down. It's like hitting the mute button. But you have to investigate a consensus. My teacher used to tell me, like, you investigate a hadith. Imam Safarani said there's 120,000 times people invoke consensus. There was no consensus on those issues. They just wanted to defeat me. You know, they wanted to do a gambit or chess mate on me, uh, checkmate on me. That's not going to happen. So we unpacked that last week. So if there is no clear text from the Quran and Sunnah, explicit, then this is where you're going to find this juristically way. The second is if there is a text, but they differ over its meaning. What does that text mean? What is the application of that text? Is that text authentic or not? If it's authentic, what was its context? And so on and so forth. Was it abrogated? Was it general and later, later restricted? All of those things come into play in interpreting text. It's called usul al the third is if there is no text. And we said last week, everybody was shocked. That's the majority of issues now. Okay. Because revelation stopped with the passing of the Prophet ﷺ. But there's a system for addressing those issues. And, and the reason that that system, perhaps you're not as familiar with it, is, of course, you live in a society where we're less than 2%, I think, of the population. We haven't scaled our religious institutions in the way that we have access to scholarship nor have we scaled in a way that we're actually training uh, religious scholars. Everybody still has to go overseas, which is great, but it's, an, it's unfortunate that we haven't thought about also creating those opportunities in a more uh, deliberate way, in a more deliberate way. We're gonna talk today about abortion. We're gonna spend two weeks talking about abortion. And today we're gonna talk about is insolvent and the positions, <clears throat> excuse me, of of theologians and jurists on insolvent. When does life begin? Because that's going to lead us into really kind of three opinions. And we're gonna mention at the end, uh, what I consider, again, speculative, but it is the position of the majority that insolvent begins after 120 days of conception. And that's very important for a number of reasons as we get into our discussion on abortion. And the week after, next week, we'll talk about different cases uh, where people are confronted with the decision of, of aborting a child. We'll walk through some of those, like, for example, rape, sexual assault. Uh, perhaps a child has been diagnosed with Down syndrome. Other, other kind of challenges that have presented themselves, which fall under this idea of contemporary issues. Everybody okay? 
everybody looks scared. Like, I'm, I'm, am I intimidating? Am I, my wife tells me, she's like, sometimes you need to smile. <laughs> Fine, I will smile if the Celtics win. See me. I'll be having a big smile. If I have some Lubia Polo, my wife's mother from Iran can make me, you will see me smiling. Inshallah. But relax and feel free to differ. Uh, I don't like this kind of autocratic Sheikh stuff. I think it's a joke. Um, if you need people to respect you to the point that they can't ask you questions, you probably don't need to be teaching religion. You're probably in the wrong place, right? That's you do that if you're like at a concert, if you're at Coachella, right? You need like 100 feet between you and the people. But we're brothers and sisters. Alhamdulillah, some of us are perhaps neighbors. We pray in the same mosques. We run into each other and we want to have that kind of relationship. Alhamdulillah. So feel free to like, you don't have to say sorry if you say sorry. Those of you know I have a rule, you have to give $5 to the ICNYU. Every time you say sorry for asking a question, why would you be sorry for asking a question? And if you differ, that's a good thing because that means you're actually listening. Uh, you're not falling asleep, alhamdulillah. So today we're going to talk about the beginning of life. Um, and there are two major texts that you want to think about. The first is in the beginning of Surah Hajj. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the development of the uh, embryo in the fetus. The second, and this is really the more important text out of all of this, is the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. <clears throat> Abdullah ibn Mas'ud became Muslim in Mecca. He was about 18 years old. And this hadith, if you have, perhaps many of you have it at home, the 40 hadith collection of Imam al -Nawi, it's like hadith number four. Hadith number four. Uh, and you'll find it there where it, he talks about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam detailing the creation of a person. What we want to think about are the different kind of religious legal schools that we have within the Sunni tradition, but we'll also allude to some of the Shia legal schools as well, just to benefit so that people will be aware of those. And there's really a great article uh, by Dr. Hattam al Hajj, who actually lives in New Jersey. He's an MD, he has a PhD, he also has an FAP, as well as being a religious scholar. So he brings a lot of you know, important um, information to this discussion, as well as being someone who's worked at the Mayo Clinic, someone who's published, someone who's been peer reviewed, uh, someone who, who can speak on these, not only in a theological manner, but also as a medical uh, professional. And that makes me feel better because that's not something I'm trained in. To give an example, I sit on the Fit Council of North America and just two weeks ago, I actually met the guy who made the pig heart, man. You know, he's a Pakistani cha-cha. Uh, yeah, subhanAllah, he was like awesome. And we were asking him like everything we needed to know because that's a question now people presented to us. Like, can I, you know, get a pig heart? And he explained so many things to us that you don't hear in the media. So many things that really help offer a cadence and animate an ultimate decision. By the way, they still haven't made a decision, if you ask me. Um, but the point is that when many responsible religious scholars are making decisions like this, very rarely is it in isolation. These are interdisciplinary decisions that are happening. And this is something that we're seeing as more of a trend, which I think is a great thing, um, that they're bringing in specialists from different fields um, before they're coming to conclusions. So things like nutrition, of course, we're always worried about what we're eating. Uh, is it halal or haram? They're bringing in people, that's what they do. The pig heart, as an example, bringing in a specialist on the pig heart. Uh, you name it. They've probably talked to someone, and I think that's actually a very healthy thing. Uh, and it's from our tradition. Uh, Imam Ibn Hazm, when he wrote about menstruation, it's you know he's very blunt and a muhalla. He basically says like, "I'm not a woman," so he went to the haram of he was in the aristocracy. So he went to the haram of of the of the sultan, and he said, "I just ask women question after question after question after question about menstruation, because I, I need to inform myself." Uh, Imam An Nawi, he was a great scholar from Syria. Uh, who in, in some classical schools of Islamic law, water that was heated by the sun is considered problematic because it was rumored to cause leprosy. So a Nawi, he goes to physicians and he asked them, you know, is it true that water heated by the sun can cause leprosy? And they presented their results to him. So he changes his opinion based on the information that is shared between him and people who are specialists in other fields. And that's why we try to encourage communities, don't expect your imam to know every single thing, but you should surround your imam with the resources or your religious teachers that are going to allow them to perform and serve adequately. And often that is going to demand an interdisciplinary approach. 
And the Prophet وسلم, he did this with Abu Bakr anhu in Mecca. And when the Prophet would go to the fair of Uqaz and Abu Bakr would tell him, you're going to meet this tribe and this tribe and this tribe. Don't talk about this kind of camel because this camel, something bad happened to one of their uncles back in the days. So if you talk about this camel, it will like lead to war. Don't speak this kind of dialect of Arabic with them because that tribe who speaks that dialect killed their grandfather 300 years ago. So Abu Bakr is like his press man, basically. And he's telling him, these are the kind of situations that you're going to run into. So he's there to, if you will, uh, serve the prophet in that capacity. That's very important. And, and, and we have to create that kind of climate uh, within community. So why I like uh, Dr. Hayat Masada being really an outstanding person who I've talked to, I've called about this issue before, is that he is a unique person that marries together a religious, a religious acumen of scholarship coupled with him being an accomplished physician. Uh, specifically uh, on this issue. Another great resource is Dr. Angie Al-Hamawiya. I don't know if some of you know her. Um, she's taught a number of classes for even my school. Uh, she does a lot of stuff with Center DC. She's an OBGYN out of, I think, the University of Texas now. She's also written and delivered like a lot of lectures on these topics. Uh, and she's also like really, really an excellent uh, resource, especially um, she's on Instagram, right? So she's very acceptable, accessible, uh, which I think is really important. So as we start this today, Alhamdulillah, I think it's important to realize we're not going to allow ourselves as best we can to get caught up in the current American political ratchet swamp, which is from the bottom of Dante's hell. We're going to avoid that because what happens with Muslims is that we get so caught up in the right and the left that we don't know Islam. And then the right and the left actually begin what starts to quote unquote define our religious imagination. And we may be actually projecting onto Islam what isn't there, but that's what we know. And that's one of the challenges of modernity. It makes politics is the qibla and the mihrab of its society. We, we understand the importance of politics, but we believe that politics is subservient to Sharia. We're not secularists. And we, we are clear about this. And we, we actually have a very important system in Islamic law that says there are really three types of realities. The first is the Sharia reality. The second is the reality of custom. And the third is the reality of language. I'll give an example, the word Salah. If we, if we go to the custom of the Arabs in ancient times, Salah has its own meaning. If we go to the language, it has its own meaning, dua. But if we go to sharia, salah doesn't mean dua. Salah means five daily prayers. So we have a contradiction between the sharia, between society, and between language. And in that situation, in the formation of Sunni law, we give preference to the sharia. So that's why, you know, sometimes as new Muslims, I remember we would struggle understanding what do you mean supplication and prayer like which one is which and we would get confused because we actually had to learn these terms from nowhere so we were confused and we would misplace them sometimes an example where and this is i think interesting especially in the face of islamophobia the idea of islam and cultural appropriation like really that you're accusing us of cultural appropriation this is insanity but that when there is a contradiction between language and custom Islamic law gives preference to custom. If Sharia is silent on it, and I can give you these examples when I worked in Dar Ifta in Egypt, when people would come, always it was funny, the Americans wouldn't want to talk to me, they would want to talk to the Egyptians, the Egyptians wouldn't want to talk to me, they wouldn't want to talk to the Americans. And I figured out why, because they, we don't know their slang, and they don't know our slang. So they were like, this is how I can get, you know, get one over on the Sheikh. I can use language that may have a different meaning to him or her. I always thought that funny. So, for example, you know, someone one time came to one of our teachers and he, he and his wife were upset. And she was claiming that, you know, she, she thought he divorced her. And he was like, I didn't, I didn't divorce you. She was Egyptian and he was from the U.S. His Arabic was wanting. Her English was, was a little better than his Arabic, but it wasn't quite there. So then they brought me in. And I said, like, what did, what did he say to you? She said, 
لا يريد أن يراني مرة أخرى. He never wants to see me again. But he said it like, I never want to see you again. So I was like, no, no, that doesn't mean divorce. It just means like he's upset. Like he's going to go to Costco, get it back, he'll be cool. Right? So how, how do I understand that? If we take the literal linguistic meaning of it, it means I never want to see you again. And I was like, please don't tell me you threw a wallahi on that, bro. He's like, I threw like 10 wallahis. So then the sheikh, he told him, it's not allowed to abuse your wife verbally in this way. This is unacceptable. This is a major sin, actually. But then secondly, you have to ask me, what does that mean in Oklahoman slang? That it just means he's like really upset. It's not like he's ending the marriage. And, so, and then the wife is like, oh, my God, thank God. Right? She understood it through a dictionary. So here's an example of language and custom colliding. Islam gives the right to custom. And that's why they say one of the qualities of the mufti is you better understand slang. Because if you don't understand the slang of the people, Al-Qarafi Al-Mariki says, you will do more harm than good. Because I may understand it different than other people. So that means that a competent religious servant in the community is saying culturally aware of things. Understands what it means. Pushing P doesn't mean pushing paradise. It has a different meaning. So alhamdulillah, we're going to see some of those intersections as we go through this issue over the next two, two weeks. But what we want to talk about today uh, insha'Allah ta'ala is the issue of insolment and we start with the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud who said that he heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say that indeed the creation of each and every one of you yujma'u khalquhu fi batni umihi arba'ina yawman occurs in 40 and actually the authentic narration doesn't say yawman and this is where you have to be careful with translation sometimes and that's why it's important to read if you can, hadith to people who are hadith specialists. I know what we're going to say, where do we find that in America? We need to scale. Right? There needs to be people that teach hadith that have that background. So actually the narration and the translation that's out there actually has yeoman days, 40 days. But the authentic narration says, فِي بَطْنِ أُمِّهِ 40. Not days, 40 periods. And then 40-40 says after that 40 period, there's a 40 period where the person is alaqa, which we understand to be like clinging to the uterus. Alaqa means to suck. So it's sucking blood from the uterus, it's developing. And then becomes a mudra. And mudra, actually, if you were to chew gum, sorry to give this example, and you were to spit out the gum and it looked like you could see your teeth marks on it, that's mudra. So this, of course, is a rhetoric, a use of rhetoric to say that there is some human formation now happening. And then the angel is sent to that embryo. And then the soul is breathed therein. Most scholars say, even though it's not mentioned in the hadith, yeah, it means 120 days. After 120 days, the soul is breathed into the child. This hadith is very important because it's going to support the majority opinion that abortion is allowed up until 120 days. And this is the majority of the Hanafis, many of the Shafi'iya, and some of the Hanabila. So we'll talk about some. But this hadith is really the main crux of the discussion. Some scholars differ over the meaning of 40. So some to be safe and to be careful, they say that actually we should stick to the minimum number. So after 40 is it, not 120. And that's the Hanabila. The point that I want to make is that the majority of Sunni schools as well as the Zaidi school, not the Ja'fari school, because of this hadith, they're going to allow abortion. The maximum, they say, is 120 days for any reason. And why am I saying that? Is because oftentimes people may think that there has to be a necessity. 
that there has to be some kind of, as we'll talk about in a minute, something that causes the need for abortion. The response of that, as we'll talk about in a second, is that because it's permissible, it cannot be made un impermissible, except with a text which is equally as strong. Jurists are very, very careful about not only permitting, but also not permitting things. But this narration of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is something that we're going to talk about. And as we finish tonight, it won't be 120 days, it will be 136 days for reasons that have just been discovered in the last, say, 50, 60 years that those ancient scholars could not have been aware of. So let's pull back a little because it's a lot of information for you to take. But I want also in this opportunity to train you also, not just to simply hear, OK, this is Islam's position on abortion, I'm out, but also to begin to learn how Islamic law works. What are some of the functions? so that you can appreciate it at a deeper level. Again, the main source for this is the Hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, which is the fourth Hadith and the collection of Imam al nawi which is found in Bukhari and Muslim. And also the second or third verse of Shulta Hajj. And again, I'm gonna quote the Hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the creation of each and every one of you happens within your mother's womb, 40 periods. The second, ثُمَّ يَكُونُ عَلَقَةً مِثْلَ ذَلِكَ is the alaqa. ثُمَّ يَكُونُ مُدْغَةً Sorry, the alaqa is first. ثُمَّ يَكُونُ مُدْغَةً مِثْلَ ذَلِكَ This clump of flesh. ثُمَّ يُرْسَلُ إِلَيْهِ الْمَلِكُ فَيَنْفُخُ فِيهِ الرُّوحِ And then after that period, the angel comes and blows the life into the embryo. This narration is the narration that forms the crux of the issue for us and allows us to posit ourselves in America as neither on the right or the left, but is always convenient being Muslim to make everybody angry at us, mashallah. But that's what it means to be prophetic. It's not necessarily about making friends. It's about holding on to principle. We're going to look at sort of the different positions found in these schools. Uh, and then next week, we can then begin to address some of the particulars and particular questions that you may have on this issue. The more you engage and the more you ask, the more we can animate the discussion. I want you to feel uninhibited uh, and encourage you to engage, inshallah. The first, we'll start with the Hanafi position. And the Hanafi position is really what's found amongst the majority of jurists. Hanafi or otherwise, especially amongst many of the contemporary, what we call majami fiqhia, contemporary fiqh councils. We have a number of them across the globe, made up of men and women, uh, as we said earlier, oftentimes looking at this through an interdisciplinary issue. The other the reason that I think this is important for you is in the face of the, the, the tsunami of meta-modernity in America, one of the most important needs we have of, religion, uh, of, of Muslims is language. How do you speak about this at work to your friends? How do you, like me, I have non-Muslim family. And I'm like, William, what do you guys think about abortion? Right? I, I need to be able to at least be conversant on the issue. And I believe that this should make up some of the fiqh that is taught to high school students at Muslim schools. Not the ancient fiqh. They should learn the ancient fiqh in middle school. But in high school, they should be focused on what are the contemporary issues? What are Islam's positions on some of these issues? So that they come out with a confidence in themselves and a confidence in how their religion can speak to contemporary issues and challenges that we face. <laughs> so the authorized position amongst the majority of the traditional, I like to use the word normative, I have a problem with the word traditional, normative Han Hanafi authorities is the permissibility of abortion before 120 days. This is mentioned by Ibn Humam, Humam excuse me, one of the great, great Hanafi jurists and for that reason, they designated as mubah. Abortion bef before 120 days is mubah. What does mubah mean? Mubah makes up the bulwark of rulings in Islam. It means it's a choice. It is the right of the person to choose. And there's no sin. That's why Imam al-Haramayn says, مَا يُذَنْبُ فَاعِلُهُ 
ولا لا يعقب فاعله ولا يعقب تاركه that whoever does it or doesn't do it there is no punishment for them and that gets into the issue and maybe we can talk about this in the future as well as like choice in islam not related simply to the issue of abortion but the issue the idea of freedom of choice utility and agency and how it plays out with our belief in divine destiny i'm going to quote him from this article from dr hatim ibn humam who's considered this kind of authority it is mubah to abort after impregnation it is permissible so long as no external features have developed in the fetus and in multiple places they said that this does not happen what he means they is doctors in his time physician said that this doesn't happen till after the 120th day and what he means by that and he clarifies and this is legal writing so there's a bunch of you know colons and semicolons which are always great to read he says and more or less what that means is insolvent up until the point of insolvent what is his proof for this is the hadith i mentioned earlier so they're holding on to the meaning of that hadith after 120 days uh, insolvent happens the next is the shafis uh, the shafi opinion and ar-ramli he's like one of the major sort of shafi jurists there's a great jurist now in Egypt. Her name is Zainab, Zainab Abdul Salam Abu Fadl. She also wrote on this issue. I ordered her book, but it didn't come. I got her other books. She's incredible. And Tanta, if you're from Egypt, uh, incredible, like really incredible uh, jurist and scholar. But Al Ramli, he says about abortion, and the strong position is that it is unlawful in all cases after insolvent, and it is permissible before that. These are ancient texts I'm reading to you. And what I appreciate about Dr. Hatton is I, I, I've been in his situation where if you quote this, people like, we shouldn't also never undervalue contemporary scholarship. I think we have a greater need for contemporary scholarship than ancient scholarship, because it speaks to our issues. But people are very anachronistic. Like they like the oldies, right? So you gotta give them some of the old school before you hit them with a the new school, basically. So what he's doing is laying this out through these very classical recognized books uh, that are trained um, within, we're trained with within different legal schools. The next is the Hanbali position and Al-Mardawi, again, uh, very powerful uh, Hanbali jurist. He notes that according to them, the permissibility of aborting the Nutfa is during the first 40 days. And that's because they understand the conjunction in the hadith that I mentioned earlier, not to be like then, then, then. They understand the conjunction thumma in this hadith to mean all at one time, everything happened in 40 days. So it wasn't 40, 40, 40. In their interpretation of the hadith, it was one 40 day period. And you remember earlier, I talked about, this is where sometimes fiqh, we get a little bit, get interesting discussions. Because they agree actually on the same text. They're using the same text, but they come with different opinions. And what she learned to appreciate, and this is one of the challenges of post-colonial meta-modernity, is that sometimes there can be truths, not a truth. On certain issues, there's a truth. God is one, Muhammad Sassam is a final prophet, I have to be good to you know, family and friends and have good character, I don't steal, all that. that's very clear. But on issues like this, there may be more one than one right opinion. And we have to live with that. So Sayyidina Imam al-Mardawi, rahimahullah, as well as Imam Ibn Qudama uh, and al-Mughni, uh, take the position of the Hanbali school, as well as Imam Ibn Jawzi and Imam Ibn Aqil. These are all like, mashallah, very important jurists and legal minds, that within the Hanbali school, um, the dominant opinion is 40 days. Some of them said 120. But as a, as a position, as a position within the school, they take 40. It takes us to the Malikis. And that's what I'm trained in. The Malikis hold a very interesting position amongst Sunni jurists on the issues of abortion. And that is, that is completely forbidden. They don't know 120 days, as we'll talk about later on, and maybe next week, because their position in contemporary times has changed. But in ancient times, 
the Maliki position was largely based on the fact that in their time, medicine was not necessarily considered definitive centuries ago. But it was considered what? Speculative. But the death of the child would be certain. So their argument, they're going to use a philosophical axiom within Islamic law. That's what's certain cannot be removed by what's doubtful. Prophet said to Sayyidina Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, that ma yuribuki la ma la yuribuki. Leave what makes you doubt for what doesn't make you doubt. Now, contemporary Malikis are going to change. Why? Because medical advances have exploded in the 20th century. But prior to that, there was concerns. So when you hear that position, as mentioned by Al Hattab, and the majority of them is that they considered it impermissible. And what's fascinating is ijhad, which means abortion in Arabic. When I studied this, uh, I think 15 years ago, I was thinking that we're going to have to go study some new books. But Sheikh brought out those, you know, the yellow paper books from the Arab world, the paper that's made from like the, the sandwich paper for the falafel. Right? That's how the books were. And I was like, man, the books are old, man. Like, what's going on? And then he was like, the chapter on abortion. I was like, man, they're talking about. And so in ancient times, according to those texts, people could actually drink something that would they considered would induce labor. So they would talk about, and here Al-Hattabi says very clearly, it's impermissible for a person to drink medicine that would impact the child. That was centuries ago. It's also interesting to note that Malikis take positions on a number of things that, you know, as we go in the future, we can talk about, inshallah ta'ala. Back now to the, the, the position of contemporary jurists. And when you hear this happening, one thing that you can appreciate is, again, it's not definitive. You don't find this like with five prayers, right? You don't see like this historical change. So if you pay attention, and this is something that we hope to talk about over time, there's a great axiom about what are called fatawa. These are all fatawa. What does fatwa mean? Fatwa means to make something clear, which is not clear. That's why in Arabic, we call young people what? Fata. Because we don't know what you're going to look like when you're young. You know, all those aunties and uncles are worried. What you going to look like? You become an adult. Oh, God, help us. And then suddenly puberty kicks in and pow, that's called feta. Because now the characteristics of adulthood become clear. It's from the same word as fatwa. That's why. So the mufti, the job of the mufti is to make something clear. I personally don't believe in individual muftis anymore. This may get me in trouble with some of my fellow uh, Jedi Knights. But the reason I take that position, I think is too much of a responsibility for one person to handle. And in, in, in the complexities of knowledge now, the complexities and challenges of the contemporary world are such that, and we're seeing this, and this was, was championed by the great Tunisian jurist, Imam Ibn Ashur, that you have to have different minds at the table, man. Different people working on the issue from different perspectives, different ideas and different ways of thinking. So the majority of Majama al fiqhia take the position of 120 days. That's the position of Al-Azhar. That's the petition, position of al barut Islami in Egypt. Um, you find the, uh, it's been shut down now under MBS um, because, you know, we have to have uh, concerts in, in Saudi Arabia instead of fit councils. Um, but the former fit council that was open in Saudi Arabia took the opinion of 40 days. But the majority, uh, across the globe take 120 days. Another important point is that the strong opinion is that it's the woman's choice, even if she's married. And in fact, the Hanafis, they say something that she doesn't even have to seek her husband's permission. Although I would encourage that, right? Just because that would destabilize the relationship potentially, right? You always want to be in communication with one another. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about breastfeeding with the Shah wouldn't that they consult one another about this. So everything that's permissible is not all, always wise. Everything that's permissible doesn't necessarily mean it's the smartest decision. But again, there may be situations where a woman has to make that decision for herself, deeming depending on her uh, context and situations. But ultimately, it's seen as her choice. 
We go now to this hadith again of the Prophet wasallam that I mentioned earlier, and we talked about those debates. And in, in the verse that I mentioned also, the 23rd chapter of the Quran, verses 12 through 14. Surah Hajj. Surah Mu'minun, sorry, not Surah Hajj. Sorry, my ass, I have COVID brain. I don't know if anyone had COVID. Anyone know about that COVID brain? Yeah, it's like, it's like watching TV in the 90s. You know, it's like playing Nintendo 64. Things are a little clear, not, not as clear as they should be. But in the 23rd chapter of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Thumma That from nutfa, nutfa of course is, is the, 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 the drops of semen, comes alaqa. Alaqa is that small, clinging, leech-like substance. فَخَلَقَنَا الْعَلَقَ مُضْغَ And then, and this is the issue, this word fat. Does it mean then or is it all in one go? And then from that comes the mudra, this small lump of flesh. And then from the mudra, idama, fakasawna la idama, lahma. And then at that time, those bones are given skin or meat or however you want to understand it. So those three periods that the hadith alludes to are further built on in the 23rd chapter of the Quran, uh, verses 12 through 14. There is an important uh, statement of Imam Ali, alayhi salam, uh, anhu, that talks about insolment and discusses that the idea of the mudra uh, is what I said earlier to you, the flesh and the bones and the development of, of the embryo. So that takes us now to just stepping back and sort of reviewing everything I said. And then I'm going to touch on maybe two issues and then we'll stop, inshallah, uh, and take any questions or discussions that you may have. Um, I always get feedback that I over-prepare. So then I get feedback that I under-prepare. So sometimes I try to hit in the middle. First of all, we talked about how uh, there are times in Islamic law where jurists have to step in and provide answers. I actually believe now that one jurist is not sufficient, that we need a group of people that are working on this, different genders, even different ethnicities, especially here in America, because we're looking at issues, our community is so diverse. So we have to make sure that we take into consideration um, that diversity when we're addressing issues, because it may impact people. I remember one time, a brother from Malaysia, he was Chinese, he came to me, he was like, do I have to change my name? I've embraced Islam. I was like, no, man. You don't have to change your name. And then someone who was his friend, who was Malaysian, contacted me and said, like, in Malaysia, if you don't change your name to a Muslim name, like, you don't, you don't, you're not buried as a Muslim. So that's a very particular issue that I didn't know. That changes the answer completely, right? So we can imagine we need people from different persuasions and perspectives who are trained uh, and have accomplished themselves to share on issues. Uh, if you're looking for a great woman jurist, for example, Dr. Inti Sarab, she was here at NYU. Now she's at Harvard. These, these are, you know, very powerful legal thinkers and writers. Um, if you're looking for someone like Anissa Tamra Gray, she's with us on the FIC Council. She's very, very strong. Uh, Dr. Hatam al Hajj, we mentioned earlier, Amja, large number of people that are there working. Uh, Brother Jabril, Sheikh Jabril uh, Spite, who was convert brother, mashallah, from New York City lived in, in Saudi Arabia for almost like 20 years, now in the LA area, has also his JD from Chapman University. He's brilliant, right? So you have these kind of people, you want these people at the table to address these issues. And we talked about the idea of qadaya, meaning those things that demand a religious ruling. Fiqhiyah means that there's gonna be differences of opinion, so we don't need to fight about it. Ma'asira means now. Things that we're dealing with now. For example, recently in Indonesia, there was a group of scholars who said that cutting trees is haram. In Indonesia, why to make, to make rubber and other things? Why? Because of global warming. And then secondly, it's undermining the ecosystems of those people in that country. That's qadai fiqhiya ma'asira. The last issue uh, we said is the danger of romanticism as well as what we call living through nostalgia. I want to live through the past. And we need to live for now. The past can only take us so far. And sometimes when we hear about the great past, and we don't see any production now that actually can undermine our iman because we begin to lose confidence. Then we talked about the issues where the sharia is looking at three realities. 
And we have this kind of process of examining three realities. Number one is what's called al-haqiqa al-shari'a. How the sharia defines things. And that's given a preference to us. And that's why we, when we talk about the, we may do a session on this in the future, Islamic culture. Culture is not a generator of Islamic law. Culture can tone and color Islamic law, but it doesn't necessarily generate Islamic law. And I think sometimes this gets confused with people. So the Sharia is the reference point. Allah says in the Quran, فرضوه إلى الله ورسوله. Return to Allah and His Messenger. The second issue we said is the Haqiqa al urfiya related to custom. And there's five conditions for custom to be admitted in Islamic law. We maybe don't need to talk about that now because it takes us into a tangent, but we can address it in the future. The first PhD done in Al-Azhar in 1922 was on the interaction of culture and religion by Ibn Abi Sunnah al-Hanafi. The third we said is related to language. And we said if there's contradictions in the three, we give preference to, who remembers? I didn't bring my candy, yes. Sharia, right? So the example we gave was Salah or Salm. Salm in Arabic means to stop. Salma Tishams. You say like, if you look up and the sun is that big, they didn't know that the sun, you know, at the time the earth was, was orbiting the sun. So they thought, oh, the sun has stopped. Say, Waqafa Tishams. And Salma Tishams. The sun has stopped. Inina Dartul Rahman is Salma. Say the Maryam says, I have declared, alayhi salam, for Allah, Salm, meaning I'm not talking. I've stopped talking. So the word Salm means to stop. But in, in Sharia, what does Salm mean? To fast. How to fast? My mother, when I became Muslim, mashallah, God bless my mom. She's like, why don't you fast at night? I was like, Shh, I'm down. But I just can't do that. She's like, just fast at night. It'll be so easy. You know, sunset to sunrise. And then she was like, baby, why don't you drink water? No, because your mother loves you. It's from a good place. But that is the battle between her understanding and the understanding of Sharia. We give preference to Sharia. Sometimes that, that Sharia designation may be different over. The haqiqa Sharia mumkin mukhtarifun fiha. If that's the case, then we're, we're patient. We don't argue. We don't need to fight. We don't need to up end communities and, and destroy people. We should be patient with one another. That's what one of my teachers said. To study Sharia needs maturity. I understand that. But then when I started seeing differences, differences, oh man, this needs a, this needs a lot of patience, mashallah. The last is related to language. What does the language mean? If those three contradict each other, then we give preference to Sharia. If custom and Sharia contradicts each other, we give preference to Sharia. If language and Sharia contradict each other, we give preference to Sharia. However, if the Sharia text is ambiguous, then we admit custom. We'll talk about this next week because it's going to be important. So, for example, the Quran says, Live nicely with your wives. It doesn't say how. It left it. And this is one of the miracles we believe of the Sharia that makes it constantly applicable is that largely custom and issues of custom are not defined by Sharia. Why? Because the Prophet is sent to all people. So if it said, if you love your wife, go slaughter a camel, bring camel's milk, and imagine if that was fard, would Islam have spread? On 121st Street, I'm going to go down the street, hit up 125th, grab a camel in front of Whole Foods, slaughter the camel, bring it home, milk the camel. If I don't do that, I'm a sinner? No. The Quran said, anything you want to buy, buy it, no problem. So here's an example of how custom can shade Sharia on issues of menstruation. Oftentimes, maybe women, you're looking for answers. What about this? What about this? It's usually left. They'll say, well, amru mar'ah, that the issue is left to the woman herself because she knows her body better than anyone else. She knows her custom. Like maher, everyone has this, this confusion. Like, how much is maher? What should we pay? Bitcoin. Now, if you ask to do Bitcoin for maher, I'm like, pay me Bitcoin. But why is the Sharia silent on Maher? Again, so that custom can fill how that order is applied. And that's why Imam al-Ghazali says, how beautiful is the Sharia, that it marries absolute obedience to Allah with the relevance of custom 
and the employment of the intellect. All three have to come together. And then we said if there's a contradiction between language and custom, who gets the preference? Who remembers custom? That takes us into this issue because as we know, there's a lot of fillers. You go on Twitter right now, it's like incredibly insane. Like it's very difficult to formulate a religious position on so many issues because politics is the qibla of modernity. And taking the modern state as the ilah is one of the goals of a post-colonial political system and political order. That's how it works. And we have to be very, very careful that we do not supplement religious nomenclature with political nomenclature. If we do that, we're in trouble. There may be intersectionality, but again, the right of interpretation goes to Sharia. And I think I mentioned this before where the brother is close to me was working on Senator Sanders campaign a few years ago who kept telling me, my political philosophy is this, my political philosophy is that. I said, can I ask you one question? What's your political theology? He said, I don't have one. I said, well, there you go. And he said, the reason I don't have one is there's no language for this. Why do we love Malcolm? Outside of Malcolm Rahimahullah being who he was, is that Malcolm brought in language for things we didn't have language for. Even as Muslims, as Muslims who may not be black, we found religious language in the teachings of Malcolm because he was brave enough to address issues through a religious lens. That's the value of scholarship. How do you speak to issues and how do you bring religious language to the table? If you are unaware and I'm unaware of religious language, then we will become like Adam if Allah did not teach him the names of all things. Why is that the first thing he's taught? And why is that what we should learn? We said on this issue of ijhad, abortion in Islam, we want to emancipate ourselves as far as we can from the cult of Joe Rogan, Bill Maher, whoever, man. You like those people, that's fine. Uh, Peterson, these, these people, they're doing important work, I'm sure people find value, that's your opinion. But I would say that first and foremost, the foundation of the bedrock has to be the dean. If not, we're gonna get played. And that's really what we learned the Quran for. Quran shouldn't be learned for scholarship. The Quran should be learned for functional religious literacy. How do I think? And that's, I have also a problem with this in America, that we posit religious studies about scholarship. I will take functional religious literacy any day over dysfunctional attempts at scholarship, any day. And you can think about this if you go to a gym. Do you like ask your personal trainer every little detail or you're just like, yo, I just wanna get in good shape. You just make tuck lead, you follow. You may ask questions, but generally we follow. Eat kale and grilled chicken, cool, I'm down. Stay away from Nahari, that's a tough one. But I listen. And then we said, and I don't think I defined it, what is abortion? How do scholars of Islamic law define it? And you can hear in this definition something very important. And that is to remove the uh, child, if you will, and, and actually the embryo, if you will, or the pre-human, pre-insold uh, um, entity from the body of the woman. Why do they say pre insold Because all the jurists agree after insolment is forbidden, although next week we'll talk about exceptions to that rule. There's always going to be exceptions. And then we talked about the main text used to derive these positions. The first is the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. This is the primary text where the Prophet ﷺ mentions these 340 periods or if you're Hanbali, 140 period, 40 days. And the 23rd chapter of the Quran, Surah Al-Mu'minun, I think verses one through uh, 11 through 12, if I remember. And then we mentioned the positions of different Sunni jurists on the issue from their respected authorized, if you will, text. What does it mean for a text to be authorized in a madhab? that it has been subjected to a lot of peer review over centuries and examined. The first we gave was the opinion of the Hanafis who say it's permissible up into 120 days. What does permissible mean? There's no necessity. There can just be a hajjah, a need. You find even some Hanafis tried to sneak in the argument that, well, maybe there's like the problem here that there's no need, and the response was, and I mentioned this axiom to you earlier, 
that when something is understood to be permissible, it cannot be made impermissible except with a text which is equal to that. So they challenged him, present the text that is equal to the text that shows 120 days. The Hanbalis respond and say the same text, but 40 days, but it's still this period, this period of leeway. The third is the Shafi school. We said the majority of them are gonna roll with Hanafis, which is rare, never happens. And then finally, we said the Maliki school that we're gonna talk about more next week because of its application in classical times to contemporary times. And the last thing that we want to talk about is that now, in the last few years, we see a change in the position. From 120 days, who can remember to what? What? Dang, I'm doing a good job. I start to feel good now. Okay. I may not eat sweet green now. That is 136 days. And why? And this is something I talked to the writer of this paper about. And that is that the agreement now amongst most uh, OBGYNs and others involved in this field is that that the conception actually happens 16 days after intercourse. Around 16 days at a maximum. So if you add 116 to 120, what do you get? 136. So the argument here is that those ancient jurists, they were unaware of this 16 day period between intercourse and the process of this child uh, starting the process of becoming human is around 16 days. So they said 120 days is mentioned in the narration and you add 16 days because of this now strong opinion presented by uh, medical professionals that takes you to 136 days, 136 days. And here again, you can see Sometimes we have to be careful, you know, scholars are horrible. They like, they're so bad. They're just not involved in anything. You know, it's very difficult to be a scholar in the Muslim world now. Either you're underfunded, underpaid, in prison, in jail, or you have to, you're like a hostage. If you're under a dictatorship, scholars under dictatorships are being held hostage. You have no academic freedom, but there is great work happening. So now as we finish. Um, the strong opinion on this issue is 136 days. And of course you want to consult with your physician uh, your local teacher or scholar uh, before you make any real decisions. We'll stop now, inshallah, if there's any other questions uh, or comments. And then next week, if, if what you ask is kind of for next week, I'll probably uh, say to next week, unfortunately, I'm just not trying to get any sympathy, but with uh, the post-COVID shot, I can go like an hour. I'm not Khalid, man. Khalid's duas are like an hour, man, mashallah. I'm like, bro, I was already struggling. I'm 49, got babies and bills. And uh, now I got this, alhamdulillah, fog. May Allah subhanahu ta'ala make it easy for all of us, inshallah. But alhamdulillah, it's better, inshallah. Any questions or comments, please feel free to, to chime in. Yes, ma'am. That's a good question. So is it binding to follow one school of thought? It's not binding to follow one school of thought. What's binding is to ask people who know. Um, there are some more, more, I would say, periphery kind of traditional aligned people who say, no, you have to follow like one school of thought. But that's not really possible now in America to even do that, you know, because what happens is, what if I'm going to follow that school of thought, like from A to Z, but my local imam is in a different school? Like, in the so if I'm, Hanif if I'm not Hanafi and they're Hanafi and they pray Asr like an hour and a half after I pray Asr, like I'm not going to go to the mosque and pray Asr? Like those schools of thought were never meant to undermine the unity of Muslims, but to actually enhance our maturity uh, to embrace differences. And Allah says in the Quran, فَاسْأَرُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا Ask the people of knowledge. So it's not an obligation to follow a school of thought. It's an obligation to ask and engage People and that's 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 something that we put. You know, I was at a I was at a fit council a few weeks ago, and I said, "How many of you are on TikTok?" They're like, "My kids are on TikTok." I'm like, no, man, you need to be on TikTok. You need to answer questions. You need to be accessible. You need to be on Instagram. I don't have time. Yeah, you do, bro. Just do one question a day. It will it will solve a lot of problems for people. So having access to religious knowledge is very important.
And then, of course, if the qualified aren't there, you know, uh, empty chair has to be filled by somebody. So, no. It's a good question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm curious about how providers should think about this, like especially OBGYNs that are practicing here that are Muslim and then taking care of patients that are not Muslim and, like, you know, asking for weeks of portions, maybe after 120 days. 120 days, and maybe, like, there are certain reasons, but, like, this patient is not Muslim, like, not following the Sharia, and the law here, and the physician in the state that comes to the like, how are you, like, what, how do you kind of think of that? I mean, it, you know, that may be a conversation you want to have with your patient, right, mm -hmm. in the beginning. Um, I think also being in touch, I think there's an American Muslim Medical Association, which I think should be important, right? They're gonna find, I'm sure someone way before all of us even were probably around went through this issue that you're going through. Uh, and then I think third, if you're able to take a position that you feel aligns with what your beliefs align with, if you can't do that, you should do it. If not, then hustle, right? America is about, sometimes we just gotta hustle. We have to navigate certain things because these people aren't Muslim in the first place. They don't have the understanding that you have. Um, but again, you may not want to feel comfortable, of course, contributing to that. So I would try to opt out if possible. But that's your personal decision. If you can't, do what you got to do. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a good question. I think the bigger issue is we don't have enough power to get anything done at that level. Like, we need to be honest about that. Um, and if uh, coalition building is going to cause us to forego uh, sacred positions, then those are, Allah says, do not cooperate on sin and evil. It's in the second verse of the fifth chapter of the Quran. I think we have to speak our truth. After 120 days, as we'll talk about next week, some exceptions, largely we're not about it. And, and that's who we should be. And, 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 you know, that also one thing I realized is, is, you know, I made these mistakes in the past when I was younger. Sometimes when you don't take a position, you actually create greater enemies. But when you take a position, actually it shows who your allies are, right? When you make them play defense a little bit. So um, I think on issues about legislation, number one, we need to work on building political power. We don't have political power. And that's why sometimes we find Muslim activists, God bless them, right? They're forced because they're trying to work for the betterment of the community. They're under a lot of pressure. Like we don't need to be attacking people and destroying them, man. Um, they don't also sometimes have the religious educational background, but they also don't have access to religious educators. Right? We don't have a pattern in the community of how do you stay plugged in? We don't have that. I think yesterday I got a call from a lady who was a director in Hollywood. She's a Muslim lady. I was like, I didn't know that you existed. She's like, yeah, we exist. We're out here, you know. And, and, and you know, she was just sound like, I'm just happy to talk to someone, you know, because I have all these questions. And there's thousands of imams in California. So how, how, did we, how do we allow at a deeper level, at a structural level, that the Muslim community, we don't have access to one another? That's the bigger issue. And then secondly, how are we going to build political power that we can actually work on things, even locally, that are important to us. I know when I was in Boston as an imam, we worked on fair housing for people in Roxbury. We worked on changing gun control sentencing guidelines that were largely attacking and taking out black brothers and sisters and Latino brothers and sisters. We couldn't have done that on our own. But how do we get into a position where we can do things on our own? So we sometimes look at these issues and forget we haven't done the grassroots work to build financially. But I think if we're going to be in those positions, we have to give our, this is what we believe. That's it. And not compromise on it. And if people are truly your allies, they're not just going to, community organizing, at least when I did it years ago, you never, that's why it makes it powerful. You don't agree. In fact, when you don't agree and you organize on issues, that makes it more powerful. Because when people realize, wow, don't you guys hate each other? 
Yeah, but today, on gun sentencing guidelines, we like each other. So that is, I think, sometimes where we lack the depth. And then I think also we lack proper regulatory bodies that not only examine imams and sheikhs, I see there's a lot of pressure on that, but also boards of masajid should be subjected to regulatory bodies by the people, by the communities who are paying for these nonprofits and supporting them, these nonprofits. Don't you think they should have a say? We saw now this week with the Southern Baptist, I don't know if anyone knows what happened, the Southern Baptist Convention, you know, they were forced to release a hidden list of sexual abusers within their institutions. So we, we often talk about social justice. What about mosque justice? or nonprofit justice, where we have proper regulatory bottles, bodies, because if we don't, and we experience this, at least I experienced this, I don't know about you guys, we begin to lose trust in these institutions. It sucks to lose trust in mosques, man. It's a tough place to be, but there's no way to hold people accountable. So I think that's great. I'm, I'm for taking our position on this as we'll talk about next week, but then also not putting the cart before the horse. Did you say sorry? Whoa, get out that checkbook, $5 checkbook. Is there any, like, is there anything that talks about whether it's possible for any reason to forfeit one point eight, or is it always just a choice for one point eight? It's never that possible for So that gets back, it's a great question. So, so, so some hand up users were like, wait a minute, permissible? Like, permissible? And then they, they began to kind of, they were like a small group, but they started to box a little. And then the majority came and said, show us a text that shows us Makro. And they were like, it's been nice talking to you, Raul. Yes, ma'am. I have to come back to you next week and look into that. I don't know. It's a good question. I don't want to give an answer that is irresponsible uh, in either way. And again, it's, the struggle is real. We're not in, like, Harun Rashid ain't running New York City, right? We're in a very different set of optics. What are, what are your possibilities in that situation? What can you do? Exactly. Um, I would rather take care of my myself. Can I answer that next week? Can you email me? You email me. But I will answer it next week also. I need to, I need to be careful how I answer. I don't want to say yes or no, and then you're gone. Then I say sorry, and I have to pay $5. I have two I have a baby about to be born. Diapers ain't cheap. And we know there's no baby formula. Although we don't use formula. Any other uh, questions about these good questions? Alhamdulillah. And it's okay. Like, if I don't know, I'll take note and answer again. So don't worry. Like, I don't answer some question. He doesn't. Why? Ask a question. I don't know. It's good. We can work on it together. We're here to help each other. Yes, ma'am. I was also just like, just going off of that. I think it also gets really complicated with like trainees versus that, like attending position. Right. Um, they're on different levels. So as a trainee, if you don't learn how to do an abortion at five months, Later on, you have to do it for a reason that, like, then is an exception. Like, the mother is going to die, for example, and you have to do it, but you don't know how to do it at that stage because you never learned it because you know it's forbidden to do it. Then it's like complicated because you can't provide this abortion if this mother is now going to die. So, yeah, yeah. And everyone in ground, so just uh, I guess Easter eggs, everyone agrees that an abortion can happen if the mother will die. Right. But I'm saying, yeah, I'm saying within Sharia. Right. So that would be a reason to learn that. Yeah. You never train in how to do it in like a stable state where no one is dying. Right. Like five months uh, pregnant, and then now you have to do it in the mom's dying. <laughs> then it's like very difficult. Absolutely. Right? So you have to have like trained in it in like a stable state as well. So then maybe you should so, train. Yeah. So yeah. I, I feel like it's kind of an issue like trainings versus like what you do for the rest of your life. Or All right. I'm working on it. I'll work on it. 
your questions. Are you from Oregon? Do you know about Voodoo Donuts? All right. I used to know about Voodoo Donuts. And I married a Lebanese Persian woman who only allows me to eat sweet green. <laughs> sweet green donuts are good though. Kale, kale donuts, the best. Any other questions? Alhamdulillah, these are great questions. And I'm gonna make sure I note them down as I go. So I have them. So training purposes. The other question is dealing with an actual patient. Excellent. Yes, you have your hand up. So it's not taboo amongst legal scholars. We talk about it a lot, right? So I'll ask you guys, like, I'm not in those circles, right? Like, and I'm, I'm a convert, so I don't have a community around me. I got Oklahoma, then my wife's family, mashallah, it's amazing. So why? Why do you think abortion is so taboo amongst Muslims? Anyone feel free to chime in. I think it's a great question. Yes, sir. It comes down to how you were saying custom takes precedent. In some okay. Ways. What does that mean? Um, just speaking from like the South Asian community, um, there kind of, we, you and I have talked about this before, there tends to be a mix up of how people interpret religion and mix their customs into it. Um, you know, historically speaking, there has been, you know, coming from South Asia, a lot of Hinduism and a lot of the customs coming from that have kind of, you know, mixed into the general understanding of what religion is for the common man, right? And through that, people have at times put precedent towards custom over Sharia. Hmm. Um, I've seen it in my own community where, you know, situation where an abortion was, you know, needed on a health perspective, there was a lot of blowback because people took precedent over custom rather than seeing the actual situation at hand. Um, People are just afraid to speak up when, you know, it's a situation that affects them as well. Wow. And again, I think that's why a mosque needs to be dealing with these issues, yeah. right? This is like, for example, whether you're for or against vaccines, right? There's religious precedents for vaccines within, let's, let's take it away from the right and the left in America, which clogs religiously how we see things. Hmm. Right? But this is what, you know, if we're always going to be talking about you know, there was a teacher of mine in Egypt who I, I really loved, uh, passed away, Rahimullah, who said that when he was young, he would go in the village to the mosque and listen to the mullah and the sheikh, whatever, and would give a lecture. All Ramadan, he would go. Every night, he would go. And then he said, you know, I, at that time, he was, he was in his, his um, religious studies. He started, Azhar starts in elementary school in Egypt. So he went, he was going to elementary school. He said, at that time, I was 10 or 11 years old. And I went to the imam and I said, imam, it's been 20 days and we're still in the restroom, right? Like you've just been talking about how to use the restroom. He's like, there's a lot of things happening in the world, man. Like the Korean war is going on. Like this stuff is happening. Like no disrespect, like, but I know how to use the restroom. Like, let's, can we talk about? So I think again, nonprofits goes back to the question earlier. Like we, we need to demand more of nonprofits that are outside of who has administrative power. Most of the mosque people are fighting over who's the administrator. But what we should be really pushing for is like, these are things that are important to us. That's why, you know, when I was uh, in, in, in a community, I pushed for town hall leadership. So we, there should be town hall leadership on everything. Because that way, on major decisions, at least on major decisions, like on the budget for the year, like people that are donating to the mosque should have a say in how that budget is used. Um, hiring the imam, like who's going to be the imam? Like if four people hire the imam, you're in trouble. But people should interact with these religious teachers, their kids should interact with them, women should, so then every, the elders, people are engaged, and then you decide, okay, we have a shura, this is, we have five or six candidates, it's like, you know, the imam version of, I don't know, survival or lost, you know, it's found, we call it found, but we vote on the imam. And I think that's how we can undermine sometimes the cultural imposition that happens through boards when the community is coming saying like, these are the things that we want addressed now. And we did this actually in Boston really well. We opened up an Alcoholics Anonymous in our mosque. And we did that because we partnered with clinical health providers. And we ran campaigns on public health education in the community. 
So from the pulpit to even our Friday night halakas, we would invite physicians to come in and talk, what is the added value of having an intake for mental and emotional health services in the mosque? You have to think about like running a campaign. And what that does is that brings what's needed to the forefront of the community and not allowing us just to go back and argue and fight about music, meat, and mortgages, right? That's great, it's important, but there's a lot of other things we can talk about. And so I remember now in Houston, I think Sheikh Walid Basuni's mosque, they went zero waste. Like, this is amazing, their whole iftar is zero waste. Like that's being at the forefront of the cusp of like living Islam now. So I think it goes back to making not just administrative demands and power and the politics and the yearly battles that happen in nonprofits, but there should also be like, we as a community, these are issues that are like really important to us. And we need to run campaigns on them. And here are the professionals in the community that can help you do this campaign. And that's where you're running. So I'll give an example, the black church in 2007, 2006, they saw the, especially like in PG County DC area, they saw in Atlanta, they saw a recession was coming. So immediately they started to open up credit unions in their churches and they prepared for what that was going to mean specifically. No one saw the targeting of housing and all that. that came later, that was horrible, right? The predatory loans and Wells Fargo. But a lot of them were able to weather that storm because their community got in front of it. They weren't arguing about, can you eat a Chick-fil-A? Like they were worried about, can you continue to buy Chick-fil-A? That's a little bit more important. And so but that's where I think we need to reorient and how we protect ourselves from it just being kind of like cultural, cultural issues. It's good questions. Any other questions? You guys are, mashallah, holding it down. I'm learning a lot. Yes. Twenty days. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, so we don't actually differ on this issue. You just made me say what I feel, uh, which now I'm going to get crucified probably on Twitter, but it's all good. Uh, it's always interesting how Muslims are crucifying one another, by the way. But um, I agree. And I think also that's a discussion where we need to be having this with women, right, in the Muslim community. You know, it, 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 if we're going to take the position of the Hanafis that the agency belongs to the women, I mean, what, do, what, do, what do Muslim women want? That doesn't make us a simp imam. It makes me a Hanafi, right? Again, the, the, the usage of, by even people on the right of contemporary terms is actually indicative of them being modernists, right? In the name of religion, I'm gonna designate people with these kind of pejoratives. So absolutely, um, I agree. I agree. And, and let me rephrase what I said and thank you for disagreeing with me. I appreciate that, is that what I meant to say is that we have the potential to organize, but we don't tap into that potential. We don't have a strategy for that potential because I contradicted myself. In Boston, we did it, but there has to be a, um, we need to work on, like for example, what I see where mosques that do it right are, are mosques that actually have volunteer coordinators, right? And most of those volunteer coordinators, at least in my era, came out of the Obama campaign, 2008 Obama campaign, 2006. 2000 because they learned organizing in that campaign 
And they came out and brought the Alinsky model, you name it, right, to the community and, and Islamicized it. That has to continue. So there are, there's a, a desire to organize, but are there entry points into organizing and how do we work for campaigns? So I thank you for, for, for editing me. Um, by no means did I mean to undermine our potential. I think numbers wise, we have some challenges, of course, but local politics, we can impact New York City. We took on the police mapping of our community. Linda was one of the, at the forefront of that, right? Something that we took on, we forced them to pull back on it. So we have that potential if we tap into it, but we can't be living in nostalgia or living romanticized history. They have to organize now. So thank you for, for sharing. And what's your name, sorry? Asma. Asma, thank you, Asma. Thank you really for sharing. Any other, any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Don't get me in trouble. <laughs> I said, because I said what's permissible isn't always wise. You know, I remember when we first converted, we're like, Shek, is that permissible? Yeah, but it ain't wise. So, okay, Shek, thanks. The difference between permissibility and wisdom. But we know also that family, and, you know, we start to learn this as we get older, uh, family isn't always rosy. Right? Sometimes women have to make decisions on their own for the betterment of themselves and their potential children. If a woman is living with an abuser, she won't have a child with him? No. And those are some of the things we deal with that we see that other people don't see. So you may give that answer, stuff a lot, brother. How could you say that? How could? Well, you don't see what we see. And you know, I really appreciate having had children when I was younger. My oldest is 20. My second is 18. My third is two. Three now, she was three last week. And then one, the firmware update is in July, right? But you learn a lot from that, that period of parenting. You know, it's like, man, I wish I knew that the first time, you know, hindsight's 2020. But one of the things I learned is, man, the, the nature of mothers to protect their children is something which is unbelievable. It's, it's indescribable. And so there may be situations where, God forbid, a woman, our community doesn't offer help for women that are being abused. At a, at, a, at a systematic level, we have here a woman's shelter, there's a woman's shelter, but like, did we take this on as a national calling as the mosque, as a, as a religious community? Are we owning this? Whether it's males or females that may be abused, we have abused children. We saw it just a few nights ago in Houston, a murder in a Muslim family, God accept them as shuhada. We didn't take that on. So women may have to make decisions on their own. You know, I, I tell you an authentic narration. Nobody will believe me that a woman came to say Na'amar and she stole. And, they, and, 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 they, and he asked her, why have you stolen? And then they accused her of prostitution. And she actually was found guilty of prostitution. And he excused her because she was abandoned by her husband. She had no support. And then he tried to find a way to, to get her supported, is the point I'm making. We theoretically sometimes talk about problems, and this goes back to organizing, but we have to now take on those issues. And, and we need to give activists a little room to make mistakes, just like we give imams and teachers room to sometimes, because these are very difficult challenges at Facebook. But that situation, I think that opinion actually by those jurists is very remarkable because they must have known something that we see that sometimes you got to make a decision. 15 minutes? Oh, wow. You guys took it up to eight o'clock is when we close. Any other questions before we close? Yeah, I have a question. Yes, sir. Just following up on the point that Asma made, in terms of practically Muslims and their political involvement in this country, we are unlikely in a lot of cases to be able to set up policies specifically to what uh, the religion says. Absolutely. And she, I think she asked a question about who do we align to? And in the case of Roe versus Wade, a party that would allow abortion less than 120 days and beyond that, or one that would not maybe at all, or uh, I'm sure not at all, but less than 120 days. Uh, 
since we are unable to tell the policy specifically for I know this is a broad question, you probably don't have a specific answer to the situation based. In terms of political involvement and creating allies, accept this back out uh, this reality and be practical about our political involvement and who we vote for. Or do we push for policies that as much as possible? We should push for policies that if it align with with sacred values that are non negotiable values and then issues where there's fiqh differences, we can be a little bit more relaxed. This is a complex. I don't think there's a one size fits all. Yeah. Um, I think also that there needs to be a really serious study of what our allies do for us. Right. And that's where people like asthma are important. I, I, mean, I hear it. These people are important allies. Why? Show me. I like that about the evangelicals. You're an ally? Why? Show me you're my ally. And I experienced this once with um, some of the Jewish communities in Boston, where we were being slaughtered by some people who are members of the congregation. And I asked Jeremy Burton, who is part of um, an organization that represents APAC, uh, the JCRC. And I said to him, would you be willing to denounce this individual that continues to attack our mosque, who actually tried to get people to physically destroy the mosque and he said, we don't denounce each other. I said, well, then we're not allies now. That's not how it's going to work, bro. All right? So I think these difficult questions need to be happening, like on occupation, Palestine, Uyghur community, but also locally. What's your position on gentrifying neighborhoods where ancient Muslim communities have been living for years? What's your position on prison industrial complex, military industrial complex? What are positions that you take? And then how are you implicitly and explicitly helping Muslims? I am Muslim first. I am about ummah building. I don't care if people don't like it, it's fine. You know, Muslims are like, well, we, can we be good to non-Muslims? Be good to each other first. That'll, that'll happen if we're good to one another. But if we can't love each other, how are we going to love people sincerely? So, yeah, I think that's a broader conversation that needs to happen. Tabith Smiley used to have those important conversations with the Black church every year with Cornell West and Dr. Farrak uh, Louis Farrakhan and Maya Angelou, you know, and they would come and sit down and say, what are the issues of the black community? And what are the issues that we need to solve? Like that should happen with Muslims. And there should be activists there. There should be people that can inform others and, and say like Asma brilliantly and, and boldly say, I disagree with you, good, help me. It's not a problem. We don't have a, even an, a, an institution where we can openly differ. So that's why we go online and we put each other on blast. So those are conversations that need to be had. What is going to be the American political Muslim platform for the next 50 years in this country and why? And what are the major issues that we need to be working on? We can even differ on them, but how would we differ where we don't destroy one another? Right? I remember one time here as we got to go, I was at an ice cream restaurant with my wife and my daughter and I saw Linda, man, and Linda had her back turned to me. I've known Linda for 30 years, MSA. And I was like, what's up, Linda? And she's like, my security will take you out. And I was like, what? And she's like, yeah, man, it's like that now, bro. And that happened to me in Boston. I had people sending me death threats from the far right. No one to help me. FBI told me, don't go here. 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 Don't walk on the street. Came and measured my windows, man. The FBI, the feds. I let the feds in my house. <laughs> Measure my windows. And Muslim community isn't there. No one even knows what's going on. Fox News does a hit piece on me. Megan, what's her name? Megan Kelly. No support. So it goes back to sort of what Asma talks about. Like, we have to organize. And then once we organize, we have to sit down and talk. Why are we adopting the ideas of like incredibly brilliant academics like Joe Rogan and Bill Maher is because we're not talking about these issues. So we listen to others. And we take from them. And we believe... That aligns with what I think my religion is. Whereas if we had our activists, scholars, and even just regular community members come in and say, hey, man, these are the needs of the community. This is what has to happen. So I think that's a long, important process. And I talked to Khaled about doing that here at NYU, inviting all of the different players and having, this, having someone facilitate it, probably 20 or 30 facilitators. <laughs> Right, and address issues. I think we have to stop now. It's really enjoyable. I wish we could continue. Uh, I think that as we continue conversations, and again, thank everyone for sharing. I really appreciate it. And I will get back on some of the questions that you ask uh, and do my best to find answers for you.
ان شاء الله بارك الله فيكم وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد السلام عليكم